Hello. Hi. It's so great to be back here at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. I always love coming here. Um, he is into his eighth decade of life, and this year marks his 60th year in front of the camera. But Christopher Plummer is hotter than ever. <laughs> I'm telling you, he, he's on a roll. So don't think of this as a life achievement award or one of those things. You know, no way. Welcome to the Santa Barbara International Film Festival's mid-career tribute to Christopher Plummer. <laughs> And tonight, later tonight, he'll receive uh, this festival's highest award, the so highest award we give, the Modern Master Award. Uh, and it's an honor that's gone in recent years to George Clooney, Leonardo DiCaprio, James Cameron, last year Christopher Nolan, and many others. But the term Modern Master, when applied to the remarkable career of Christopher Plummer, is ironic as he's arguably one of our greatest living stage actors, a true classic master who has played uh, so many of the great roles. In fact, he's Canada's gift to Shakespeare and, and all the legendary playwrights. Um, but he's also got this film career that is enjoying this a welcome renaissance. 54 years after his movie debut, Plummer is also thoroughly modern Chris. In fact, in the last decade, he has done some of his finest screen work. And since turning 80, he's received two let me say it, way, way overdue Academy Award nominations. I don't know what Oscar was waiting for, but incredibly, they're the first in a career that boasts seven Tony nominations and two Tonys, seven Emmy nominations and two Emmys and countless other honors. He's had an indelible career on stage and on television, but tonight, is about the movies. Uh, just consider this list of roles from Cyrano de Bergerac and Hamlet, to Oedipus and Rudyard Kipling, Sherlock Holmes and John Barrymore, Leo Tolstoy and Mike Wallace, Iago, Lear, Macbeth, Captain Von Trapp, and of course my favorite Klingon, General Chang, <laughs> among many, many, many others in his 100 plus films. So beginning with his 1958 screen debut opposite Henry Fonda and Susan Strasberg in Sidney Lumet's Stage Struck to his touching Oscar-nominated performance this year as Hal, a 75-year-old man who learns it's never too late to start living your life, here is a taste of Christopher Plummer's cinematic journey. The notices are fine. Did you have me brought all the way over here to tell me that? Man, I didn't get a bed till 4. It's now 8.30 and I'm going back to it. Joe, not everybody left last night when you did. Well, they feel worse than I do. I wish I felt the way you do. You, with a hangover, I'd settle for that. I got myself involved, but good. Don't. I don't feel like smiling. It's a shabby business. Well, what did you do? You go out on the town after we all left? No, I wish I had. I've been out of the apartment since six. Yeah, Tom told me. I couldn't face her. And uh, you want me to write you an exit speech? Well, it's much too early in the morning for that. It's too late in my life to feel the way I do. She's a delight. She's decent. She's... I don't know girls like that. She's everything I don't have time for, and I'm not going to make the time. You know the way I live. She's a fool. She's she, a nuisance. She, and she's stage-struck. You know that. Well, how do I know? You, you brought her. Here? I want you to give her this. What is this? It's a fair back home. Money? 
I don't know where she lives, but there's enough there to keep her traveling away from me, out of my life. I've seen too much. I've lived too long. I can't start this. Here, go over to the apartment and give her that. She'll hate it. She'll hate me. But the sooner she finds out the way things are, the better for her. I know this is tough for you, Joe, but it's tougher for me. Nothing's tough for you. Joe. Joe, I didn't know. You've been on my mind I grow fonder Every day Lose myself in time Just thinking Of your face God only knows Why it's taken me The only one that I want I don't know why I'm scared I've been here before Every feeling, every word I've imagined it all You never know If you never try To forgive your past And simply be mine I dare you to love Last one. Oh, Lord. I know. <sighs> there. Oh. Now, this is for you. Yeah. Now, that means gay pride. Yeah, everyone knows that. No, they don't. Yeah, everyone knows about that. Oh, of course not. Don't be silly. Pa, pretty much everyone knows that that means gay pride. <laughs> Just they really? Yeah. Did you know about me? No. I just thought you and Mom weren't in love. Oh, we loved each other. And you were gay the whole time. I learned how not to be. For 44 years? Yeah. I knew I was gay, though. I mean, at parties, I'd be staring at the husbands and not the wives. What about sex? I wish she didn't think I was the greatest lover. <laughs> but we may do. Look, I like my life. The museum, our house. That's what I wanted. And Mom. You wanted Mom too, right? Yes. Stop that. She proposed to me, you know. I said, uh, look, I love you and we're great buddies, but you know what I am. And, and then she says, that doesn't matter. I'll fix that. I thought, oh, God. I'll try anything.
Christopher Plummer. Yes. Please welcome Christopher Plummer. you. <laughs> God, that was a, was, oh, well, thank you. That was quite a trip all the way up here. I thought you'd have gone by now. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're here at the beautiful Arlington Theater, one of the great, great Southern California classic theaters, you yes, know, for yes. a man who's done so many wonderful, uh, you know, theater uh, you know, plays and things in so many theaters around the world. This is a, uh, another one for you to uh, chalk up. I'm here. absolutely thrilled. Thank you so much for having me. That's marvelous. Yeah. What did you think uh, watching your, uh, your, your life in movies? I wasn't here for that. <laughs> 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 I, I time it so that I can walk in just at the end. Uh, no, that was nicely put together. But why was there such a concentration of beards? <laughs> <laughs> Only a few of the good-looking shots that I thought <laughs> that back then I'd fallen in love with myself. <laughs> it's been, you know, it's a, it's a remarkable career you've had, obviously on stage and uh, and television, in, in the golden days of TV, of live TV as well, and yeah. and, and movies. Um, you know, what was it that sparked you as an actor? Was your mother uh, introduced you to the arts? Or? Yes. Well, she was. Extraordinary. She took me to everything. We grew up in Montreal in the, in, the, in the 30s and 40s in Canada, and she was very artistic. And although we were all good athletes, I played tennis and skied all my life, uh, she insisted on my going to see everything that came to town in the way of theater, opera, what, what a ballet, whatever. So I was, at the age of six, I was brought into the theater, and, and, and I never left. I, I loved it. I thought it was great. And then, of course, the nightclubs in Montreal in those days were prolific. They were great. There, were, there was one for every day of the year. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent most of my time at the bar nursing a beer as a kid and watching extraordinary artists like young Judy Garland and Frank Sinatra, young Frank Sinatra came to town, and Maurice Chevalier and Edith Piaf and all those extraordinary people I grew up with. And I thought, this is the most exciting life of all to be able to these extraordinarily talented people get up and sing <coughs> in front of a bunch of drunks. <laughs> and, and they hold their attention. How the <laughs> hell do they do that? <laughs> and I thought that was the biggest challenge of anything in our career, <laughs> in our profession. So I, I, uh, that's what started me off, yeah. yeah. Now you came from, a, you know, it was a very nice background, privileged background. You're the great, great grandson of uh, one of the first prime ministers of uh, Canada. And, uh, you know, it was a nice life. And uh, so actually to become an actor, you almost had to move your way down rather than up, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. it was tough to sort of express emotions. Um, I was taught, you know, as, as one was in sort of semi-Edwardian times uh, to not not to show your emotions and that that was how you were trained in public you didn't show what you felt and what the hell is acting all about but showing your <laughs> your emotions and of course so that was rather hard to I, I wished I'd been born poor on the streets because that was a cinch compared to the to searching for the proper anger and the and the and the kind of honest emotion that could break through that makes what we call artists in the theater or movies. That was, that was a t tough choice. It was like uh, starting at the top and working one's way down. But then my family lost a lot of their money, so I saw a whole change. <laughs> it was extraordinary. I, I grew up rather quickly 
<laughs> seeing that how, how courageous they were and how they didn't show any of their sort of self-pity or if they had any to the, to the public in general. They, they behaved with great bravery and pretended they still were living in, a, in the style that they were accustomed. And I admired that kind of wonderful uh, attention to elegance that they, 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 they played. I admired it very much, but it was time to go, so I crossed the border and went down to New York. Yeah, and you were in New York in the, in the wow, the golden age there, the 50s, when, <laughs> when you were there. Your first Broadway play, though, uh, was not a hit, I guess. Well, the great actress, uh, Eva La Gallienne, I don't know how many people here know who I'm talking about, but she was one of the great theater actresses of our time. She also translated uh, all, all of Chekhov's works from from the Russian, and she also um, translated many of Ibsen's works from the Norwegian. I mean, she spoke Russian and Norwegian fluently and, and, and became this extraordinary actress. Uh, and she asked me to be in a play that was her, it was her comeback. And uh, I didn't have a huge role, but it was a good one. And we opened, it was my first Broadway experience. I thought, oh my God, how exciting this is. <coughs> it closed in one night. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's it. I guess that's my career. <laughs> and I remember going down to the Schubert offices and lining up with all the other people to get paid. That was so embarrassing. <laughs> but uh, it was so glorious to be able to work with the giants of the theater, and I, like Judith Anderson and I played opposite her in Medea in France. We took it to Paris. And then Catherine Cornell, who was a great theater star, was so good to me, and we, I did two as replays with her. Uh, and I, I worked with all these extraordinary women and, who were great, great stars of the theater. They, they also had their own private trains. Uh, Catherine Cornell special it was. And uh, it was a whole train. We traveled right across the country. There was the dining car and her private car for her bedroom. And then there were our bunks uh, <laughs> in the other cars. There's a lower echelon of player. And we used to have such fun going across the country. We'd walk up and down at night in the cars listening to who was sleeping with who. <laughs> 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 listening for any telltale <laughs> whispers and um, sweet nothings. <laughs> and, I love it. But, but can you imagine? Ethel Barrymore and, uh, and uh, Catherine Cornell were the last people to be uh, the actress managers who, had, who could afford to travel like that. It was like, it was like traveling with royalty. It was uh, quite extraordinary. And during that period in New York, um, you did a lot of live television. Those are the golden oh, days of... Everybody bumping into each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be kind of scary, though. You're on TV, this new medium. Well, yes, but we didn't know anything else. We didn't know there was such a thing as tape. <laughs> and and uh, here we were. I, I remember uh, it was uh, one, of, one, of the one, of the one of the great stars. Who am I talking about? The... The, the guy who played with Jane Fonda, you know, he was... Oh, really, Lee Marvin. Thank you, Lee Marvin. He was doing a, a Western in a, in a Brooklyn studio, live, of course, and he rode his horse, and he couldn't control his horse. The horse ran through a papier-mâché mountain. <laughs> and was so frightened it crapped. Oh my God. Nationwide television. Uh, I mean, you couldn't, get, you couldn't get away with anything. <laughs> and I, I remember, uh, can I tell a little story about, sure, yeah. <laughs> I'm playing opposite Vivica Linfors, who was an absolutely beautiful Swedish actress. And we were doing the Meierling story, you know, the, the great love affair with the crown prince of Austria and Maria Vecera, his mistress. And they, they were that, the famous suicide pact and they both committed suicide uh, as a sort of kind of farewell and a lover's triumph at the end. It was an extraordinary bit of history. And it's a half hour show and it's Robert Montgomery Presents, which was quite a popular thing. And it was good material. It was a good story. And uh, I'm waiting to make my entrance into the little cabin 
to meet my lover, Maria Vecera, in order that we may pursue this suicidal evening. I'm, <laughs> I'm standing in those days off camera. It was pretty murky and dark, rather like this theater at the moment. <laughs> if I look out there, I couldn't find the entrance to, it's a half hour show. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> you, you gotta kind of be on time. And, there was no, we called them floor walkers. They were sort of the stage managers of the time for television. I couldn't see a floor walker in sight. And then suddenly I spied a little light. But, by the way, while all this was happening, my poor old Vivica didn't know what to do. She was striding up and down the living room and she saw a piano and she sat down and started to play. <laughs> I mean, anything to fill this ghastly pause. <laughs> finally, I saw this little light and I head for it. And, I, and here I am in all my medals and the great Magyar cloak and everything. And I see this thing and I, oh, there's a little opening there with a light in it and I burrowed in and I came up medals and all, I'd gone right through the fireplace. <laughs> Jesus. The, the, the director, who was an absolutely paranoid fellow, came up to me after and said, why? Why did you come through the fireplace? And I said, you're fucking lucky I came through anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. No, they were hysterical days. They oh really, my God. Things happened all the time. It was just awful. It had to be fun to be there. <laughs> now, you got, into, you got into movies. Thankfully, the movies rescued you from, uh, from live TV. <laughs> yes. And uh, Sidney Lumet was yes. a way to start. I mean, we saw at the very beginning of the reel there, introducing Christopher Plummer on that big screen yes. in Stage Truck. Uh, with Henry Fonda and Susan Strasberg. Yeah, Sidney was a, an extraordinary little guy. I'm so sorry. He just passed away recently, as you know. Uh, and he lived to be a good, bloody good age, too. I think he was in his 80s. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I don't have much time. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for me, Sidney. <laughs> but, but he was lovely to work with. He, a great director. The first director, really, who sort of understood the streets of New York. And he really, he really did a wonderful job in, uh, of bringing the streets of, of New York to the public and doing fantastic plays by Paddy Chayefsky and all the, all the great writer, television writers of the time. And they were terrific in those days. They really wrote. And uh, so it was fun working with him. Uh, he was a darling guy. And then, then uh, the first big budget, huge spectacle movie that you were in, uh, came in 64 actually, was The Fall of the Roman Empire. Yes. Sophia Loren, Stephen Boyd, a whole all-star cast. Of yeah, I know, that was, those were the big epics, they were fashionable at the time. Yeah. And it was extraordinary that Sam Bronston, who was the producer of all those films, uh, what was the one with Charlton Heston that was so great? El Cid. El Cid, which was a wonderful picture. And then uh, David Niven was in the... Uh, the 55 the Days the of Peking. 55 yeah. Days of Peking also. Sam Bronson was the guy who had, who had worked and into turning the Pasetta into a huge sort of money, money sort of economic kind of triumph. And uh, with this money, he produced all these extraordinary movies. And he had, I guess he robbed the rich to pay the poor, but he, he really did do a marvelous service to the, the industry. He was the, the most prolific producer of that period of time in the 60s. And then, of course, they, the sad thing about him was that they took all his silver away and his houses and everything, and uh, he vanished out of thin air. Wow. I guess they, I guess they caught him, but... But uh, I think he did a, 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 I think he did us a service. <laughs> well, you know the um, the movie. I mean, all these things happen while you're making it. You, you rode chariots and things, and, and you did a scene with Stephen Boyd, I guess, where the light was going down. And... <laughs> oh Jesus! Th th those days, th the money was extraordinary, and, and you, you you had these three-hour lunches. I mean, it was like I guess it was like in the silent days, but the money was no object. I mean, outside of Madrid, they, the, the famous restaurant Madrid 
21 sent up all its waiters at lunchtime uh, in their red-coated uniforms with food from that incredible restaurant right up into the mountains they, they came and served lunch with wines and champagne and uh, every day it was like that it was wonderful how we got any film done I don't know because, because once that lunch was there you said ha ha thank God I'm inside it's awful cold today and I know that I'm not going to leave this dining room until six o'clock when the lights are. <laughs> well anyway one day it's very late in the afternoon and they have one of the biggest scenes at all. We were, by this time we were in Rome and they used the Appia Antica as this long, be that be long beautiful entrance into Rome for Stephen Boyd who played Livius to Sophia Loren's Lucilla and the, sh the shot was in about 3,000 extras all with their shields and swords and he had to ride down all the way and I was in my chariot I was playing the Emperor and he's riding down past this huge shot and then he's supposed to get off his horse come up to me and say Lucilla has returned to Rome well it was very late in the afternoon and the, the, they were losing light and they could not, this was a very expensive shot and everybody was terribly tense and the light was disappearing behind the yard arm and here comes Stephen on his horse and I'm sitting and sitting in the chariot waiting for him and he comes up, rides up looking great. I thought there was a bit, something a bit nervous about him but he was pretty, he was pretty in control. He got off his horse, walked quietly up to me and said, Sophia is back in town. <laughs> And the, I mean, the look on his face, he had, he thought, what have I said? Oh my God. So, of course, they had to do the whole thing over again the next day. It must have cost thousands and thousands oh and my thousands. God. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to take a look at a scene. Oh, Maybe not that scene. But we're going to take a look at a scene from the fall of the Roman Empire, followed by another scene from a movie that, when it was on our reel there, that you made a, quite a reaction to, a certain musical that Christopher did. So we'll talk about that right after. Here it comes. <laughs> okay, I promise that's all we're showing of the sound of music. Our S and M, as you refer to it in your book, which um, <laughs> his great book, in spite of myself, it's called. Um, uh, you've got to check that out. For it's just fabulous stories. But okay, I, I, a lot of people have stopped me, knowing I was going to do this, and said, "Don't ask him about sound of music. He doesn't like to talk about sound of music." But that movie obviously has lived on. Oh yes, it has. <laughs> Did you have any idea that this would be... No, nobody had any idea. Julie didn't. Nobody did. We knew that it, by the, when, when we were filming the interiors in California after leaving Austria, uh, we, we sort of got an inkling that it was getting hot attention from the press because we had a lot of it. But we certainly didn't dream that it was going to be as hugely successful as it, as it was. Um, <laughs> Should we move on? Uh, <laughs> no, no I, I, I've got another question. You actually almost walked off that movie, I think, because they asked you to record your songs early or something. Yeah, I, I did the film, and this is absolutely true, because I wanted to do a Broadway musical about Cyrano de Bergerac. And uh, I'd never sung professionally before, or, or not even in the toilet or the bath. <laughs> so I thought, what a great idea. And they very kindly offered, I, I'll, I'll use this film as a sort of practice ground for my singing. And, uh, and so we arranged that I would sing at the end of the making of the film, and the, uh, when I trained a little bit. <laughs> but they suddenly switched their idea and wanted me to sing before we started, and I certainly wasn't ready. And that made me furious, so I, I, I said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it. And uh, it was too late, of course. They would have sued 
sued me, and I, I said I had to I had to finish it. So I was a little bit there was a little bit of angst in me there, uh, but it, it turned out to be wonderful because I had such great I was, made such great friends with Julie. Oh yeah. Uh, and the, did uh, work with her again actually in On Golden Pond. Yes, uh, indeed, television. indeed. Yeah, we yeah. I, I adore her. She's a great pro and a great lady. And the, and the, the only one that really drove us nuts was the little girl, the little... Uh, uh, Gretel, the little... The, the yeah, Gretel. Gretel, yeah. Yes, we had to, because they had to be educated at the same time, so there was always a, a tutor on the set to teach them. And then, just as you were about to do a scene, suddenly say, sorry, the kids need their lesson now. Sorry. So we had to wait around for the stars, <laughs> like Gretel. And, uh, <laughs> And she was the most obnoxious little thing. Oh, God. <laughs> well, years later, I'm in a play on Broadway, and, some, and somebody comes in to introduce a friend. And the friend in walks this knockout blonde. <laughs> she said, hi. You know, I'm Gretel. <laughs> I said, and how wonderful you were in the picture. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, <laughs> now, that same year, 1965, uh, you did another picture that came out, and you got to work with Natalie Wood, who I, I was a great star, at Inside yeah. Daisy Clover, yes. um, at Warner Brothers, in the yeah. old kind of studio system there. And, uh, yes, it was a, the, the Warner Brothers was great. They were extraordinary. The, the prop men, they were, they were there for years. I mean, they, they kept, they were very loyal to their, their technical staff. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first day of my shooting there, the, the prop man came up and gave me a a, a fresh scotch. He said, what, what, what do you drink, sir? I said, scotch. Here's, here's a scotch. I said, what the, good God, I just, it's only 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and he said, no, no, it's a tradition of ours. This is your first shot, sir. You, whatever booze you want, we will toast you. And uh -huh. it, 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 unbelievable. There was great style over at Warner's. I love working there. <laughs> and I adored Natalie. She was such a, everybody, as Orson Welles once said about her, that everybody's a little in love with Natalie, mm -hmm. and everybody was. She was yeah. such a, a darling person, so generous, a real Hollywood star, and the, she made no bones about it. She was generous and divine and was so afraid of the water. She never, never came near it, even when we went on the boat together with, with RJ, and she wouldn't go near the, near the water. She, she, she was really terrified of it, and how ironic that her death uh, the, the sea took her, which was just uh, so sad. Now that movie, um, you played Raymond Swan, who was the studio uh, head, basically. Yes. And uh, Robert Redford, a, a very young Robert Redford. Was yeah. Too. Yes, I'm sort of, yeah. He's yeah. rather promising, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and much too good looking. <laughs> With all that impudent red hair. Yeah. Uh, no, he was, he was terrific. That was his first film. Yeah, that think. was, yeah. I think wow. so, yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to take a look at a scene from that, followed by a scene from I, I Love This, um, this Movie, because it's a very interesting thing. We're going to talk about The Royal Hunt of the Sun, which you had done on stage and then on screen, but not in the same role. No. So um, let's take a look at Inside Daisy Clover and The Royal Hunt of the Sun. Oh, yeah. Cool, the Royal Hunt of the Sun, which you had, uh, you, you had done on stage in New York. In New York, yes. Yeah. And uh, David Ca Carradine played the, that part that I played in the movie, which is Atahualpa, of course, the, uh, uh, the head of the, the, the god of Peru in those days that uh, yeah. Pizarro had conquered so ruthlessly. It was a very interesting play. Uh, the film wasn't quite as good as the play because Peter Schaffer didn't write the whole script. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, it, but we tried, and I love playing that creature. I, I, <laughs> That's I, such an unusual thing, because you, you had obviously done all these performances as the other character. Yes, and, it was from, and I love playing the other character, but it's a very, very talky role, uh -huh. fine for the theater, but not for the screen, yeah. and, and although Bob was very good in it. But uh, I remember I had to learn this ancient Quechuan 
That's that strange thing I'm trying to say. And we, we had actually someone there who knew it was a dead language, but who had, who had remembered some of the sounds that they made. And I was working very hard on it. Um, um, big speech I had, and I was walking up and down the, the hall outside the set trying to remember it. <laughs> so it sounds. Jesus, it was hard to remember. And I was walking up and down reciting this long speech. <clears throat> and I, as I was, Tony Powell, who was the set designer, was, all, was making and sewing that wonderful cloak made of nothing but bird's feathers, beautiful cloak. And he was working on it. And, and he, <clears throat> I said, hi, Tony. He said, what, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm just rehearsing this Quechuan for a scene I have to do later. He said, he said come on, you... You know that's not Quechuan. I said, well, of course it is. it is. But you know what it means, don't you? He said. I said, no, what are you talking about? What does it mean? It means the cat sat on the mat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that went down like a great cup of sick. <laughs> oh, my God. No. Uh, let's talk about something else. <laughs> It's great. You know, I'm curious, uh, you know, because of all, all your stage work and theater work, it seems to me that that's probably your, your first love, um, doing that. And you've always done that. You've always gone back and forth, you know, between film roles. And oh, yeah, I think roles. you've got to. It'll be t uh, to me, it's so monotonous to just do one of the medium. And then I love going back to the theater because it replenishes your technique, you know. You, it's, it, it spurs you on to do things better. You learn so much in the theater because the audience is your partner and uh, you learn so much from the live audience it's so exciting for instance i didn't learn enough not to clean up that story that i just told you <laughs> <laughs> and you let me know <laughs> and that's how it works <laughs> and that's why i love the theater i really do i love yeah. it <laughs> Were there any regrets along the way that maybe a film role you gave up or something you gave up to do theater, you know, and then later saw that, wow, I wish I might have done Yes, that. the only role that I wish I had played was the, the king in Beckett. Oh, yeah. Because I'd done it in London and we'd, it was a fabulous production and we, I won all the prizes. It was a, and I was absolutely certain I was going to get the film. Uh, Peter O'Toole, my arch enemy and friend. <laughs> Got it instead, um, and uh, I was I was thrilled for him, but I hated a son of a. <laughs> <laughs> that was um, interesting because you did, you know, in the mid '70s, you did a movie, I think, an absolutely terrific film called The Man Who Would Be King. Oh yes. Um, directed by John Huston, and Peter O'Toole's co-star in Beckett was Richard Burton, and in this case, you came in. Yes, because Burton was going to play it, and obviously for some reason he, he, he didn't find the role interesting enough, so I, I played it. And I loved doing Kipling. It was beautifully written, that script. It was just a marvelous movie. And John Huston was one of the great directors that I've ever worked with, and certainly one of the great directors of all time. He had such a sort of wonderful, sardonic, cryptic wit about everything. He, he, and he really understood the spirit of Kipling better than any other film that's ever been made on Kipling. That was the truest Kipling-esque style that's ever been seen on the screen as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, and it was a short story and John and Gladys Hill turned it into this wonderful, wonderful, superbly Kipling-esque movie. Yeah, and it was, it was, what was John Huston like? You had not really known him before you went into this? Well, I know you of him, of course we all yeah. did, and everything was true. <laughs> he, he was wildly, uh, you know, macho in, in, in every, every respect. And he would leave the set and go and shoot elephants or something, which is uh, difficult to forgive him for that. But he was always going off hunting. And we'd sit around for a couple of weeks doing absolutely nothing in Africa, waiting for him to come back. <laughs> and uh, said, oh, some pretty good kills, Chris, we had on the way, yes. <laughs> but glad to be back, yes. <laughs> He talked like, he talked like that. It was extraordinary. 
He put a, put a camel behind me in one scene. <laughs> he was always playing terrible tricks on his actors. And he had, this cam he had me stand right in front of the camel and deliver a speech, which I thought was rather touching, the speech. <laughs> and uh, not so. The, the camel <laughs> kept doing that and knocking me forward. And, and then we'd, John would say, we better do it again, Chris. <laughs> and I'd start again, the camel would do it again. And this went on and on and finally said, Chris, the camel stays in the scene, no, no matter how you dislike him. <laughs> but, you, but you ought to be able to treat animals the same way you treat actors, because they are exactly the same. <laughs> he was diabolical, <laughs> but, I, but I loved him, and he had a, a great heart uh, underneath all that. And there was almost like a, a thing during the making of the film, I, they almost wanted to cut Kipling out of the movie. This yes. was a movie, obviously, with Sean Connery and Michael Caine, but yeah. your role. <laughs> yes, suddenly the studio wanted to, um, yeah, cut Kipling out. Oh, cut Kipling out, for God's sake. He's just, uh, he, he, he holds up the story, you know. <laughs> now, if they'd cut Kipling out, because Kipling was the author that kept writing the thing and the characters would come back to talk to him. It was a lovely idea. That was the whole spirit of the movie. And you take that out, it would just be an ordinary epic, you know, in the sh a shootout in Africa. <laughs> so, uh, Sean Connery, God bless his heart, said, they're sending the guys out from uh, California. I've told this story before, and it was Peter Goober who was, a, <laughs> who was the head of uh, the studio then who was responsible for this diabolical trick. And he, went, he, came, he came all the way to Marrakesh, and, and Sean was waiting for them. And just as they were about to get into the elevator after this endless flight, exhausted, Sean grabbed Goober and put him against the, the elevator and said, if you cut Kipling from the film, I'm going back to London tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> well, they saved, Sean saved my life. <laughs> I, I, he's a wonderful guy. I told this to Philip, to Peter Goober, actually, and P Goober fell on the floor laughing. <laughs> It's a long time afterwards. And that's why we still have Christopher Plummer in The Man Who Would Be King uh, to be able to see that clip. And we're going to see after that a clip from a movie I insisted when I knew we were doing this that they put in this tribute because it's a movie that a lot of people may not have seen, but it's a, it's a gem and it's one of my favorite uh, performances of yours. It's called The Silent Partner. Oh. And uh, so we're going to take a look at those and then we'll talk about Silent Partner. Which I think okay. Is okay. Yeah. <laughs> Dress to Kill there, for sure. Um, that was an interesting little movie. Curtis Hansen, you know, the, the wonderful director, yes, wrote yes, it. wrote it. Before anybody really knew who Curtis Hansen was. It was that, an early that, film. That's right. Yeah. And, and the, <clears throat> it was a story of a, he was a frightening character I played. He, he always was dressing up in different clothes and trying to rob the bank and stuff. And, he, and uh, this was at the end of the movie, and he comes back to really get the back, but he comes back, and I thought he should come back as somebody else. Or, or, he's a strange kind of transvestite creature who, who obviously loathed women because he wanted to be one. And, uh, and I thought, what could I, and my wife, Elaine, who's sitting out there right now, or, or maybe that's her leaving. <laughs> but, uh, she suggested, why don't you do it? As, as a woman, put on a Chanel suit, and, and it'd be very interesting at the end to see this sort of raunchy little guy turned into this, well, well I did, and, and I've got the whole thing, and the swing backs, and I got sort of rather suspiciously comfortable in the <laughs> Well, you look good. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> but that was
was kind of cool because that's, you know, you did a lot of big studio movies and things like that, but that was kind of a... Oh, I love that little movie. film, and it's still, it's still, it, it had a kind of uh, charisma of its own. Uh, totally holds up. A director named Daryl Took, uh, uh, who you worked it, with yeah, on uh, The lo Birds. A lovely too. director, yeah. Yeah, Wonderful yeah. Director. You also did a movie that I think, and especially now, since we've seen a couple of Sherlock Holmes movies that have turned into these blockbuster kind of things yes. with Robert Downey, you did one of the best, I'll, I'll say Basil Rathbone, and you are the best Sherlock Holmes I've seen on oh, screen. Oh, and, um, oh. yeah. And it's, uh, it's a movie, another great movie. You got to go out, Netflix it, rent it, wherever you find it. Uh, Murder by Decree. Oh, yes. Yeah, with James Mason is a great Watson. Yeah, so he was a wonderful Watson. And you're the truest Watson I've ever seen, I think, to the book yeah. and to Conan Doyle's vision of what, because uh, you believed he was a soldier yeah. as well as a doctor. Uh, and he didn't suffer fools quite as much as Nigel Bruce did in the uh, Basil Rathbone films. Nigel Bruce was my, f my, f my first cousin. Really? Yeah, I never met him, uh, but he, uh, he always entertained me vastly in those. So silly astros, you know, it's a lot. What, what, what? <laughs> I, thought, I thought, God, to make a career out of that, his whole career was going, what, what, what? <laughs> He was wonderful in, in Lassie Come Home. He played the Duke, remember? He was, he was talking to Lassie. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Those wonderful no, actors. J Jimmy was, a, he, he, he was a, a terrific Watson. He was the right, the right sort for You should stuff. have done another one. You should have done another one. Well, we were going to do it, and oh. then James died. And it was so sad, because James Mason was in a huge, hugely great shape. And we were such good friends by that time. And I was so sad when he died, just unexpectedly, uh, very early in his life, really. Mm -hmm. And we were going to do another thing together, and sadly it never happened. Oh. Um, now, what do you think of the, the new Sherlock Holmes? I haven't, movie? I've honestly not seen Robert Downey's. I, I'm a great fan of Robert Downey. Uh -huh. I think he's a great actor. Uh, but I have not seen that, so I can't make any. Yeah. But I also love very much the television, uh, uh, the BBC uh, version. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Brett, uh -huh. whom I mm -hmm. thought brought all the eccentricities of Sherlock Holmes beautifully detailed onto the screen. Yeah. I, I thought he was smashing. Um, well, we're going to take a look at, at your Sherlock Holmes here, A Murder by Decree, and then I mentioned it in my intro, uh, my very, very favorite Klingon. Yes. Yes. Listen, how, this is not exhausting the audience, is it? it seems I, are, are you getting exhausted by this? No, no, no. They're well, looking. I am, goddamn. <laughs> Moving it along, though. All right. <laughs> Let's take a look at Murder by Decree and Star Trek, <laughs> The Undiscovered Country. So, are, are you a Trekkie? Are yeah. you? you oh, are? yeah, I was a Trekkie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Back in the 60s, I watched those uh, early televisions. They were wonderful. And Bill Shatner is a terrific actor. He, for so long, he, he played that part, but he was, you could tell that he, he gave such variety to it that it showed how many marvelous other parts he could have played in all those years. And, and he did. He's a, he's a wonderful actor and a very funny man. Well, we you, had fun. You actually have, uh, people may be surprised to know this, but you have a whole history with William Shatner way before this movie. Yeah, uh, we were, when I was professionally, uh, I mean, I've been a professional actor since I was 18 years old. And at 18, it was in Montreal, and we were on radio together, both Bill and I, he's about the same age. Um, and <laughs> we played in both French and English. Uh, on, on the air. We did French soap operas and English soap operas. Um, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, so Bill and I really had a history of, and, and they called me back a thousand years later. And well, then he was my understudy in Henry V at Stratford. I suddenly, I suddenly came down with um, some awful kidney stone disease. I was, or m maybe it was syphilis, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
<laughs> and I, I couldn't go on and, and give my performance as Henry V. So Bill Shatner, this was in 1956, Bill was my understudy, and he went on. And uh, I, 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 not knowing this, I was full of morphine. I was in great pain at the hospital. And I was, they found me staggering down the hall, and the nurse obviously said, come on, back to your room. I said, no, 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 I got a, I got a performance. <laughs> Henry V. <laughs> and uh, no, sir, you're, you're back in bed. Well, I learned the next day that Bill was incredible. He, he not only knew the part backwards, he, he did things that I hadn't done. He was he stood up when I sat down. He sat down when I'd stood up. He was extraordinary, that son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I knew he was going to be a star. <laughs> <laughs> so, so years later, we, we, he called me and wanted me to play a Klingon. And I thought, God, this is wonderful, a lovely idea. And it was a, quite an amusing script, uh, beautifully directed. And mm -hmm. I said, yeah, as long as I don't have to be made up with all those funny forehead things, I don't like that. That doesn't look real to me. Can I, can I decide myself what I want to look like? Because you've got to have another kind of Klingon. This is, everybody's too used to this, these guys with a big butt. So uh, they nailed that thing into my eye. <laughs> <laughs> with a nail, and they only gave me one little wisp at the back, and I love my luck. I look like a sort of frustrated Moshe Dayan. <laughs> <laughs> it was great, and I liked the, um, the, the vocal, the language that you, you chose to use, because you weren't really speaking Klingon here. No, so. the, best, the best line in the movie was by David Warner, who was the head Klingon, who said we were doing, quoting Shakespeare all through the film. <laughs> and um, he said, uh, you haven't heard Shakespeare until you've heard it in the original Klingon. <laughs> That's my favorite line. Um, you actually went and did a video game, I think, as, as, as him. Oh, later. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Video it's great. It's, as it's General like, Chang. As General Chang, yeah, it's a real cult item. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to 1999, I know. <laughs> but really, and it's sitting here across with you in this, I, I keep thinking, wow, Mike Wallace, you know, um, that was such a phenomenal performance that you did in the movie The Insider yeah. uh, with oh, Russell Crowe when you played Mike Wallace. Yes, I love playing, I, I love that. I'd, I'd watched Mike Wallace, of course, since I was young well, on television when he for all those years of watching Mike, I didn't have to do any research at all. He was so, he was so vivid in my, my, my mind and my memory as so that hard core journalist, TV journalist that he was. He, he, he really understood the medium. He knew how to shock people and get them to perhaps even cry if necessary. He was a cruel guy, but he was a marvelous TV journalist. And, um, it was great fun playing him. I didn't have much trouble with his voice because we, are, we have the same timbre. You know? But uh, I, don't, I don't think any of those guys liked the film. They felt uh, that uh, they had been betrayed, not by the film necessarily, but by the, um, the, the Lowell Bergman, I think, that he went over to our side. Uh, but I was terrified that he would loathe my performance. And when I met him at a party, he. He said, you know, I, I, I said, I loved, I loved you doing me. He said, I think you're terrific, and I was so pleased. <laughs> uh, he said, you know, I've done some lecture tours, and I always open my lecture tours by saying, I am not Christopher Plummer. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, I, uh, thank God he liked it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, that was important to you, though, that he, that he did, yeah. Oh, that, yeah. He, yeah, oh, God, when you're playing a real-life person, you don't... You don't want to let them down. Yeah, it's almost a special responsibility when you're playing. Yeah, it, it sure yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. Now you played a couple of real life people in the in the two clips we're looking at. One is Mike Wallace, and then one just like Mike Wallace, Leo Tolstoy, um, <laughs> in your first Oscar nominated performance in the last station. So let's take a look at those.
Congratulations on the last station. It brought you, I just find this amazing, you know, a lot of the work we look at and everything. That was your first Academy Award nomination. I, you know, really, what did it mean to you at that point to get that kind of recognition? Well, I mean, it, was, it was lovely. I thought, oh, how great. And, yeah. You know, it's, uh, it doesn't, it isn't something that uh, preoccupies me. Yeah. I'm, too, I'm having too much fun doing the work, you know, I really do. And I know a lot of actors are always saying, oh, it's the work that counts. Well, it is. Yeah. And uh, so it doesn't, I've won other prizes, it's okay, it's awfully nice when it comes along, but yeah. it's not, uh, yeah, I'm not to be preoccupied by it. Yeah. Um, that was I a mean, wonderful work, by the way, too. So. After all, you know, Charlie Chaplin didn't get an award till he was something like 83, wasn't he? Un unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, he, and he practically invented the cinema. <laughs> I mean, and yet they denied him this award. Uh, it's, it's, so, it's, so I'm in a hell of a good company. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I think is great, and what you said about the work, too, is, and I mentioned the word renaissance at the beginning because, and I saw your Golden Globe speech uh, a couple of weeks ago, too, and you said, it's wonderful to be back in the town of uh, Rintintin and <laughs> King Kong and things, and are you having fun getting such great roles uh, at this point you in know, your career? Yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. I, I never dreamed that I'd get them on the screen. It's yeah. easier on the stage for me to go back and play Lear and, and, and all the great roles because I'm at least a distance from the audience. They don't see all the <laughs> telltale age lines and stuff. Uh, so I can play younger than I am on, in the theater, but on screen that's a bit tough. <laughs> and and uh, so I'm absolutely thrilled that I'm working much more than I've worked for ages. I mean, it's just great. Keeps me young. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, it yeah. really does. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of that, you've done like a, a number of wonderful um, animated films too and voices and that must be fun. Um, I, one that probably nobody's seen that I loved called My Dog Tulip okay. where, where you play J.R. Ackerley. Um, it was a very touching movie actually of animation. I, I loved it and I loved the, the drawings. Yeah. The drawings had such a sort of quirky style to them and he he, he was a wonderful character but I, I the one the only thing that i thought was wrong with my dog tulip <clears throat> was there was one crap too many <laughs> the dog was always crapping on the street and it was fine because that's what happens with dogs but it went on and on crapping i said i know now, that would have been a tough Hollywood producer who said, one crap too many, so let's get, <laughs> let's get rid of that crap. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, speaking of dogs, you played Charles Muntz opposite a bunch of dogs in Up. Yeah, love dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know you personally love dogs. You have a lot of dogs yourself. Yeah, we too. did have a, a, a great big family of dogs. Yeah. And they, for 18 years we had them. They all lived to an extraordinary age. Yeah. Uh, I think it was the steak tartare we gave them. <laughs> <laughs> they hated dog food and loved people food. <laughs> and that's what kept them alive, Dallin. <laughs> and uh, we're going to show a couple of clips, both with the theme here uh, of dogs, Up, uh, as Charles Muntz, and of course, Beginners, which we're going to talk about, which has won you your current Academy Award nomination and so many other awards. Um, so let's take a look at Up and Beginners, where you, where you also play with a dog, Cosmo. Oh, yeah. Uh, playing That's how I'm going to end up, playing with dogs. <laughs> let's take a look. <laughs> You sure were not a bother. I'd hate to impose. No, no, it's a pleasure to have guests. A real treat. Treat! Treat! I use that word. Having guests is a delight. More often I get thieves come to steal what's rightfully mine. No. They called me a fraud, those... But once I bring back this creature, my name will be cleared. Beautiful, isn't it? Oh, I've spent a lifetime tracking it. Sometimes years go by between sightings. I've tried to smoke it out of that deathly labyrinth where it lives. Can't go in after it. Once in, there's no way out. 
lost so many dogs. And here they come, these bandits, and think the bird is theirs to take. But they soon find that this mountain is a very dangerous place. What happened with Michelle? I don't know, you know. She seemed great. She was great. Well, maybe you should take out a personal ad, you know, where you can explain your situation. My situation? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you, you want to be in a relationship, and you can't stand one. That's your fatherly advice, personal ads. Well, <laughs> a lot of people use them. <clears throat> I did. What? If Andy wasn't going to be monogamous, why should I be? Jesus, Bob. Chooses yourself. And it? Uh. Yeah, Pop. Oh, God. Oh, I know, I know. God. Come on. Hey, no, 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 no. that's uh, gay pride day stuff. Just leave those. Right. And that's... Um, Gay book club. Uh, we better leave those two. But what about the chair? Is the chair gay? The chair is not gay. Yeah, obviously. <sighs> pop, pop, the, the cord won't go so far. Ah, oh, God, to hell with it. <clears throat> oh, what's that? Now that you're out of the hospital, you'll have to exercise, get you back into shape. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Okay, let's try it. I'll, I'll, I'll show you how. Yeah, later on, I'm gonna make myself some tea. Okay, I'll go clean it up. It's a lift here. Uh, your mother's vase needs some flowers. You need to tell Andy that you're not well. Pop, you're just out at the hospital. You should take it easy. You'll tell him, won't you? Me? Please. You've won, you've won the Golden Globe and the Critics' Choice, and you're nominated for the Oscar, the BAFTA, the Indie Spirit, the Tomorrow the SAG Award. Um, this is a wonderful role, and it's, and it's given to you by a Santa Barbara native yeah. named Mike Mills. I know. <laughs> <laughs> who wrote and directed it and uh, inspired by his own relationship with his father who ran the uh, Santa Barbara. Yeah, it's just Museum. extraordinary how, how unbelievably unsentimental Michael was about it and which made it so touching that he gave his character of his father such humor and such courage and it was just a glorious role to play and I'm eternally grateful to Michael. However, I'm still waiting for the first paycheck. <laughs> this is an indie uh, movie. It's, uh, yes, you that's, know, right. It's... that's right, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, they're, they're working on it, but it's... Um... <laughs> But it's great, and, you know, and it's a movie that's going to live on, you know, no matter how much money it makes in its first run, you know, people are going to keep discovering this. I think so, because everybody who's seen it seems to warm to it and love it. I know. It's, uh, I loved it. Yeah. In playing that and knowing that it was inspired by his father, did you come with any kind of special preparation for this, or what did no, you do? No, I mean, how could I prepare for someone I never knew or never met or seen? And I was slightly worried that, you know, he, that Michael was going to be a fuss pot about, <laughs> about my doing his father absolutely correctly, and he'd be at me all the time. I thought, well, no, no. and not at all. I mean, he was so sophisticated about it and so free. And I, it made me feel so relaxed in front of a camera. He, he, he just directed me superbly. He, mm -hmm. he let me go. And, uh, and that's the mark of a really terrific director who trusts the people he casts. Yeah. Do you, um, yeah. Uh, the themes of the film are so, they're so universal. And it's, it's such an important theme, I think, in watching yes. what happens to Hal uh, at this point in his life. Yes. Yeah. Because he dies happy and fulfilled. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's extraordinary how grateful he is and how relieved he is to, to be so happy at the end of his life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's a lesson I think we, we should all remember. About. Yeah. To, to, uh, it's a liberation of sorts for him. Oh, absolutely. Extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. Just extraordinary. Um, and, and I mentioned the dog, obviously. I mean, we should give him some props here. Um, that's Cosmo, who played the wonderful... This is a big year for Jack Russell Terriers. Yes, and I, I think our, our dear little Cosmo was much warmer than Uggy. <laughs> In the artist, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, that was a circus dog. He was, <laughs> I mean, yeah, he was so glib. <laughs> Cosmo was a real dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to hear from uh, Mike in, in a couple of minutes, but I want to, um, before we wrap this up, I want to uh, comment on a couple of other movies. You're wonderful as well in another movie that came out at Christmas time called The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo by the great, um, <laughs> the great David Fincher, another wonderful director. Oh, we're fabulous with. director. Oh, yeah, wonderful. It's a terrifically good film. And very loyal to the book, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I take my hat off to Rooney Mara, who plays with such courage and bravery in a, that, that wild and extraordinary role, almost pornographic in nature. And, and she does it with such courage and god damn it she's brave i think <laughs> and got an oscar nomination herself yeah, which deserves it well deserved very yeah. well deserved and i have to say i was as you know in toronto at the toronto film festival where i where i saw you and i was among the i think i was the first audience in the first audience to see this extraordinary filmization of your your legendary barrymore stage performance yeah. you've now turned into a movie yes and that's a real treat that we'll probably see next year, I imagine. Yeah, well, I think it's tomorrow, isn't it? It's going to have its U.S. premiere here at the Santa Barbara Film Festival tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, and I think you're going to uh, be there. I, well, I'm going to be there for a second. Yeah. <laughs> But that's a great, that was a great opportunity to bring that role, which won you a Tony Award, uh, yeah. to the screen. Yes, I was thrilled, thrilled with that, and I think it, 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 I think it does work in a cinematic way, even yeah. though it is largely a stage performance, because he does, the, Eric Canuel, who directed it so well, uh, does pull it out into, the, into the other rooms and other spaces and other memories and other times, and then brings it back to the stage again. And uh, I, I think it kind of works. Yeah. Oh, I, totally. hope. I hope. It, it works. I, I can guarantee you it works. It's, it's really well done, and I've seen film stage shows before that don't work nearly like this. This has got a wonderful kind of feel to it. Yeah. And they're going to see, uh, you're, you're going to see a little sneak preview of that. A, a little clip from uh, Dragon Tattoo and Barrymore before we, uh, we wrap this part up. So take a look at that, our final clips here. <laughs> I hope this wasn't too painful for you. I think they really loved seeing you here and seeing this, uh, you know. <laughs> Thank you. And yes, hang on, because there's more. Here is the executive director of the Santa Barbara Film Festival, Roger Durley. Um, I, first of all, I have to thank Pete Hammond for amazing moderation tonight. <laughs> and um, I, I know that Mr. Plummer doesn't, you know, he doesn't like praise, and I'm going to keep it very brief, but I've never wanted to honor anybody more than Mr. Plummer. Um, I'll explain very briefly. Um, I grew up poor in Panama. Um, Central America and um, my mother wanted me to believe in art and took me the very first movie I ever saw was The Sound of Music and I fell in love with the arts and, and movies because of uh, The Sound of Music and I loved Mr. Plummer ever since and um, I got a scholarship to come to United States and in 1982 
just about, I came to high school to New York City, and I read that Mr. Plummer, yes, the son of music, Mr. Plummer, was on Broadway on, in Othello with James L., L. Jones. I had never been to the theater. I bought myself a ticket, and I walked in, and Mr. Plummer introduced me to Shakespeare, and um, I... Um, I'm extremely grateful for all you've done for not just me, uh, a small little person lover in the dark, but there's many others like me who in the dark have loved you for so many years. So thank you so much. Um, it's also a great pleasure for me to introduce Santa Barbara local um, great filmmaker Mike Mills who's actually coming home tonight to honor Mr. Plummer with the Mother Master Award. So please welcome Mike Mills. Thank you. Uh, it's a real honored to be part of your mid-career tribute, Christopher. Um, and I feel like I need to warn everybody that, you know, he really is one of the more gentlemanly, gallant men I've ever met. But he's also quite a rascal. You should know this. Uh, my, one of our very first rehearsals, I said to Christopher and Ewan McGregor, I said, you're gay, Christopher. Go to Barney's. Ewan, take him to Barney's. I want you to buy a scarf. He, he wears scarves. I gave him $200. Um, I said, Ewan, I didn't know Christopher that well. I said, Ewan, you know, he's 79. Take care of him. Make sure nothing happens. I'm used to taking care of my father. <laughs> On the way there, Christopher starts looking at Ewan's legs kind of a lot and says, you know, what are those? What are you wearing? And Ewan says, well, they're skinny jeans. And he says, Christopher says, they're quite tight, you know. <laughs> and Ewan says, well, yeah, they're skinny jeans. They get to Barney's. Ewan dutifully goes to the scars, as I requested. Christopher heads off to the jeans bar. Uh, he, according to you, and he flirted with everyone. He, he bought several hundred dollars worth of jeans, much more money than I gave him. He doesn't carry money with him. Ewan had to pay for them. Um, I, when he came back, Ewan was sort of, you know, white in the face. And, and he said, Mike, I'm sorry, I couldn't control him. You know, he was unstoppable. So that was my first introduction, you know. And, um, it's very true in, in his memoir, and you guys said this at the beginning, Christopher describes, you know, most actors climb up the ladder to security, to fame, to, to a, a safer world. And Christopher climbed down the ladder, you know, I think to um, a grittier, a freer, a more wild and more real life. And at least that's the man that I felt like I met. Um, the scene that actually you pointed out here where Christopher is explaining how they got married. Um, when we were rehearsing it, he pointed to that scene. It was a fragment of what you see here. It was a very small little piece. And Christopher pointed at that piece and he said, I need to say more here. And I love that he was saying I, that he was Hal, that he was the character, and that he had something I didn't know about my dad and, and the script. And I said, what do you need to tell your son? What do you need to tell Oliver? And to my very great surprise, he said that I loved her. And you know, I was really taken aback. I was, how did he know that? How did he know that my real father really did love my mother, even though he was also gay for their 44-year marriage? And when I was thinking about it, you know, Christopher has spent his whole life wandering around inside the complicated, contradictory, crazy human soul. He spent his life thinking about and feeling about us humans. So, of course, he could intuit the complexity of my father's loves. And it was one of the many times I saw Christopher's mind and heart reaching out past the script, through the lens, to the people, to the audience that would eventually see our story. Of course, his years on the stage would train him for this, but I think it's also this climbing down the ladder to people, to life, to, a, you know, connection that is his great talent. Um, Another thing you should know is Christopher will never love you as much as he loves other actors. So just 
know that. Um, I, I, I got pretty jealous of Christopher and Ewan because like, I'd hear them laughing all the time in Christopher's dressing room and I'd hear like a snippet of some really scandalous story about Tallulah Bankhead or you know, something really nasty that Noel Coward said or I'd hear John Hewson's voice booming out and Ewan laughing, you know. And, um, and I, I finally got it, you know. Actors are his chosen family. Um, and it was really beautiful to see this, the way that actors, the people on set, it's his tribe. Um, and I started noticing that when Ewan really did something beautiful, when Ewan really went somewhere and Christopher was you know, off camera, he would reach in and pat Ewan or he would do this little like and, and a thumbs up. And it was, such a, it was such a beautiful little gesture of camaraderie and, and just love for what they do, for what they're doing together. Um, there was another moment, oh, actually you showed it, he's getting his hair moosed. It's a very incredibly important scene in the film. The character that he's playing is sort of expressing all of his lust for life and yearning. And the actor he's with, I figured out, holy crap, he's never been on a set before. Ronaldo, beautiful Ronaldo. And he didn't know how it worked. And Christopher is an amazingly worldly actor. You, you expect him to be kind of pissed or frustrated. And said Chris was like, um, he says love to everyone on set. And he said, love, come here, you know. The camera goes there, you come here, you say your line, we do it again. He, he silently, you know, effortlessly, lightly taught Ronaldo how to do the scene. And it was again, this like beautiful expression of actor camaraderie. In this memoir, I dragged out his, it's, you know, 650 page memoir. You know, you, it's a little light reading. I dragged it out for this, and I found something I underlined before I met him. And, I, and I, when I read it again, it blew me away as much as the first time. He wrote, Orson Welles, the Marquis de Sade, Augustus John, Dylan Thomas, John Barrymore, each in his own way took life by the throat and forced it to its knees. I wish like hell I could have done that. I don't pretend to own a speck of their recklessness or daring, but damn it, I gave it the college try. First of all, what a freaking crazy list of people to put together. <laughs> but what an inviting and on I fell in love with him when I read that. I mean, what an honest and beautiful and opening thing to put in your memoir. Uh, but I don't really agree. Uh, in Chris's last scene in our film, of course, his character passes away. And, and Ewan cried like a real primal, raw cry that like made the set buckle. And Ewan, I said cut, Ewan peeled away. I came up to Christopher and Christopher said, oh, he's gonna hurt himself doing that, you know? <laughs> and, and I don't know why I, I felt like I needed to apologize for you and I said, I don't think he meant to do that, he just felt that for you, you know? And Christopher said, oh, I'm jealous as hell as that. <laughs> I love that he said that. There's so much life in saying that. There's so much desire. But the thing that made Ewan have that magical transference was that on our set, and I bet on all sets, with his words and his body, his knowledge of the soul and the audience, with his chosen family and a few very dirty stories, Christopher does grab life by the throat, or at least he embraces life by the throat, and maybe that's better. With all he's done on set with him, you still, there's this palpable, life-affirming hunger in him. And the stories he tells, his work as an actor, there's this humility you can just feel. And it kind of says, you know, a good life and good work don't come just because you want them to. The humility, this humility fuels his powers of curiosity that leads him beyond the traps of being a legend, of having done so much work. And perhaps most beautifully and simply, there's just this daily dedication to working that I saw. Working hard will bring you all the magic that you desire. As Ewan and I would often say, I want to be like that. So, just how weird and strange that we're here. <laughs> how strange and perfect that we're here in the Arlington. Where my parents took me to see some of my first movies. Um, on the street outside, my father would walk his real Jack Russell Terrier. Uh, one night, there, you know the balconies here? My father got obsessed with going up in one of the balconies. And I said, Pop, you can't do that, you know. 
and he climbed up into the balcony to look in the window, and the ushers came and dragged him down, and <laughs> he was like, you know, but it's me, I can look in the balcony, you know. Um, but here we are, across the street is the Trinity Church, right? That's where my father came out to his wonderful out gay priest. Just down the street is the museum that him and my mother gave so much of their life to. On Figueroa Street is the house that they both passed away in. And in that museum, maybe some of you saw this, there really was a show, as in our movie, where he invited everybody to bring their stuffed animals. Um, I think I, I met some people tonight who I knew was at that show. And really on the, on the wall of that museum, he did put a quote from the Velveteen Rabbit, as in our film. Uh, and the quote part of it says, the rabbit asks, what is real? And the horse explains that becoming real is something that happens to you over time. Sometimes it hurts, and generally by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, and your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints. But these, th these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. How strange and perfect that you would express my father's desire to be real, his desire to come down the ladder, away from a stability that really just made him invisible. You keep showing the world how to come down the ladder to life and to connection. You made my father real for so many people, and he would have loved what you did. And I wish you two could have met because you would have got along so well. So Christopher, congratulations on everything. I'm so honored to be here. And I have a little something. Don't hurt yourself with this. speech Michael just made, my God. The ham in him will come out. <laughs> I love his generosity and, and um, I'm jealous that he grew up here uh, because to, to receive this is just extraordinary for my first trip really to this part of this part of the world which is one of the loveliest parts of the world and I can't think of anything nicer than, than this prize I'm sure I don't deserve it but nobody's going to take it from me <laughs> thank you Mr. Hammond for being as usual so generous and you too Michael God bless your heart I wish Ewan were here. I don't know. He was so wonderful in the movie. That, <laughs> that scene stealing swine. <laughs> he's always away when I get a prize. I wonder if he does it on purpose. Anyway, thank you so much. You've been so bloody generous to sit there for so long. Thank you. And thanks for this. <laughs> <laughs>